From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 44, recorded on June 21st, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Today we're recording at ASM Microbe in San Francisco, and joining me right here in vivo, Nels Eldi. Hey, Vincent. Great to be here together at uh, ASM Studios, I guess. It's a little more professional, I would say, than LD Lab Studios, which know. is a little more homespun. I like your studio. <laughs> That's generous of you to you have say. a nice view of the Wasatch Mountains, That's right, right the Western Rockies. <laughs> we don't have them here. Not too shabby, but San Francisco Bay is pretty good. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, yeah. It was Just, foggy this morning. Well, and I heard you were a little in. delayed. Yeah, I got in late last night. On your flights. So I didn't see but anything. Good to see you. So Nels and I are going to record a couple of Tuivos here. This Can't is the first wait. of two. Yep. And at each one, we have a guest. Uh, and Nels, maybe you could introduce our guest. Yeah, I'd love to. I'm really excited to introduce Paul Turner from Yale University, who just gave a spectacular and inspiring uh, seminar here, lecture here, uh, just kind of fresh off of that half hour ago. Welcome, Paul. All right. Thank yeah. you, Nels. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent. Pleasure to be here. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I have not met, but looking forward to chatting. Yale is not too far from Columbia, but it could be on the other side of the earth, right? Yeah, you know, we <laughs> hang out in our siloed locations, unfortunately, what way too much. are you in it? Yeah. So I'm in ecology and evolutionary okay. biology. So um, you did, probably don't know Shankar Ghosh, my chairman? No. He was chair of micro at uh, Yale, but that's the oh. medical school. You're, probably, you're not in the medical well, school. Well, I'm in the microbiology program at the mm-hmm. medical school, so I do have a tie to the okay. med school. Okay, okay. Yeah. And you're still the chair at Ecology and Evolution, aren't you, Paul? Thankfully, I'm a recovering chair. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm no longer the chair. I've handed over the reins to uh, very competent successors, and I hope that I have lifelong immunity. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, Paul, we're going to talk about some of your cool science today, but let's start by exploring uh, your, your past. Mm-hmm. Where are you from? So, uh, that's a little complicated. I was born in <laughs> Philadelphia. And then soon after that, my family moved to the Bay Area. So I'm actually back in the place where Mm -hmm. I was in early childhood in Piedmont, Oakland area. And that Mm -hmm. was until third grade. And then the rest of my upbringing was in Syracuse, New York. So I generally identify with upstate New York as my home. Upstate New York. Orange man, right? You got it. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Good basketball, right? Oh, great basketball. Don't get me started on that. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Need another hour. (laughs) My brother brother, uh, worked for... Lou Carnesecca for many years at St. John's. All right. So for those I, of you who don't know the original Big East. <laughs> there you go. Back so that today. doesn't exist anymore, right? Oh, uh, well, I think there's a Big East, but Syracuse isn't in it anymore, Syracuse, so I'm not keeping track. <laughs> St. John's, Villanova. Was Villanova, the Georgetown. Georgetown, yes. Oh, yeah. And I remember, right. I'm not going to talk about sports, but <laughs> Patrick Ewing <laughs> yes. playing in the Big East. Sure. It was amazing. Sure. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, after uh, after Syracuse, where'd you go to college? So I went uh, not very far from Syracuse. I went to University of Rochester, mm-hmm. thinking I was going to be a biomedical engineer, uh, design robotics and stuff like that. And fortunately, uh, they have terrific biology at Rochester. And I went back to my original childhood love <coughs> of biology. And that's when I was a major in bio. Isn't that where um, Harmeet... That's, that that's right. Yeah. Or University of Rochester. This is a hotbed right. for evolutionary who biology. Was, who was his yeah. uh, advisor? It was Tom Eichbush. Do you know, so, you know Tom? You yeah. must. I've met Tom before. I didn't okay. interact with him too closely when I was at Rochester. Yeah. I was with the EE Beers. So mm. uh, fortunately, if you're a biology student at Rochester, you have to meet with a faculty mm. member once a semester. And uh, I got to give credit to John Janicki and at that time, Andy Dobson, other people were there who were really inspiring me with their classes in ecology and evolution. Mm-hmm. And they were the ones who suggested I should think about a PhD mm-hmm. in that area. And I, but you went to Rochester I, wanting, you said robotics. Yeah, well, so. yeah, yeah. Their reputation is a lot in engineering yeah. and engineering runs in my family. So I thought I was interested in engineering until I found out that I was more interested in biology. I see. That's an interesting twist, right? Yeah. yeah. Although that, kind of an echo actually of Harmeet. So he was a chemical 
trained in chemical engineering yeah. before yeah. he started his PhD at the University of Rochester. Mm-hmm. And then his first genetics class, he ended up TAing and then going on. So hmm. these uh, great theme here. Yeah, of, there's something about Rochester yeah, that exactly. inspires young biologists. That's I right. Like to hear that. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Back next week, I have a uh, Rochester professor on, on a podcast down in Baltimore, mm-hmm. Jennifer Nyack. Oh, yeah. Works on influenza virus. Sure. Great. Great place. I, I went to Cornell, so I know upstate New York. Oh, yeah, you're no stranger bit, to bit. cold winters that are full of snow. <laughs> you know, I, I brought my son to uh, into to to visit mm-hmm. UR and RIT right when he was looking for colleges. I'll never forget. It was the middle of July or August, hot as anything. Yeah. And there was a pile of ice on the ground. I said, "Look, it's just ice even in the summer." Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was from Don't the hockey. Me. It was from the hockey rink. Oh, sure, it was. <laughs> <laughs> But Paul, so you were at uh, University of Rochester, but you didn't quite escape winters, did you, in your next academic move? Yeah, well, I, I moved around a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, my next academic move actually was to a very sunny place okay. with wonderful <laughs> weather. I joined Rich Linsky's group when he was at UC Irvine. Oh, and, before the... Yeah, okay. I was thinking yeah. that was... I didn't have the You're timing thinking of Michigan, oh, right? Michigan State, yeah. yep. Yeah. He started the long-term evolution experiment uh, the same year mm-hmm. that I entered his lab. Oh, wow. So that experiment and I are very old, as your (laughs) listeners can deduce. Uh, But then it was about three years after that that I moved with him when he went to Michigan State Mm -hmm. University. And yes, cold in the winter. And uh, But I I had a wonderful time as a graduate student seeing two different programs. I think that that was very useful to me. Yeah. And really kind of a a pivotal time. So Rich Linsky, as many of our listeners know, uh, has been involved in is sort of famous for his long term uh, passaging experiments, evolution experiments with E. coli. And so I'm really curious though, Paul. So that, that yeah. three year uh, move from Irvine mm-hmm. to Michigan State, that must have been pretty harrowing in terms of is this experiment going to continue? Yeah. Those kind of things. I, I, I agree. I think that uh, Rich didn't seem overly worried about that. Mm. Um, my own thesis work was pretty tangential to that project. I was using plasmids as model systems to study host parasite interactions and theor- theoretical predictions, which I th- thought and I still think was really cool and a very different approach. Uh, I passaged the long term lines once. Okay. I think everybody who comes through his lab, either you're really doing that experiment and helping with passaging, or you're like me, and you get to do a token passage. (laughs) So I am in the record books there as having passaged it once. But uh, I really have to credit, especially my early days in Irvine, they had this terrific EEB department, and I came in thinking, well, I had a huge interest in evolutionary biology, but I didn't have any prior training, like a master's or anything. I had just taken some classes at Rochester and had done a lot of reading on my own, Stephen Jay Gould especially. Mm. So when I was in Rich's lab, I was like a kid in a candy store that uh, I always sort of felt I was going to be one of these people looking at charismatic megafauna and natural populations and you know, like wolf and moose dynamics on Isle Royale. And uh, that didn't happen. Rich convinced me that you've got the power in experimental evolution microbes mm. to test just about anything you want within reason. And I embraced that. Yeah. So that was great. Yeah. And after Michigan, what was next? Mm-hmm. So I did three postdocs. Wow. I did the first one with Lin Chow when he was at University of Maryland, College Park. Uh, he, he's now at San Diego. Uh, and I was with him for three years. That was wonderful. It was my introduction to phage biology. I hadn't worked on phages before. And uh, just a lot of fun working with him on co-infection studies and kind of evolutionary consequences of when viruses interact. And we got to test game theory models, prisoner's dilemma, and all this fun stuff. Uh, and then I did a second postdoc with Santiago Elena in Spain, mm-hmm. in Valencia, mm-hmm. Spain, learning how to culture arboviruses and test, uh, specialist generalist theory. And my third postdoc was back in the States at National Institutes of Health in Bethesda. And that was with Jeff Cohen and Steve Strauss, who was there at the time. And, uh, that was on herpes viruses, mm-hmm. on Xerocella zoster virus. And a pretty tough project that didn't Mm -hmm. yield much data, but I learned a ton about molecular virology. Mm. And and then I went to Yale right after that. So you're a virologist. 
I'd like to think I am. <laughs> At least an armchair one. <laughs> yeah, the two, the two postdocs, Santiago and yeah. Cohen Strauss, terrific. Yeah, it was terrific. a lot of fun. Um, I, I know uh, Cohen, Jeff Cohen, very well from hepatitis A virus sure. days, because yeah. I worked with him uh, early on. John Ticehurst, uh, trying to. Uh, we did the first cloning of the genome way uh-huh. back in the early eighties. Mm-hmm. John Ticehurst actually came up to uh, to MIT, but just before I left. And uh, he was with uh, Purcell. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. And uh, he showed up one m- Monday, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, we're going to clone this week. I said, okay. We did. So after NIH, mm-hmm. yeah, go right I, to Yale? Yeah, I threw my hat in the ring for lots of uh, advertised jobs. I felt like an ecology and evolution department would be a good home for me. Mm -hmm. I also applied to med schools and didn't get any bites. So I guess (laughs) the system dictated what would be a good place for me. And yeah, I kind of, I've really been very happy in an EEB department where uh, I I often, uh, I guess I try to think like a virus. And, And when I do that, I try and think about uh, other virus genotypes around me in a population, and um, that may sound hokey, but uh, conceiving of populations and how they interact with environments, both biotic and abiotic, has just always intrigued me, and I've just been so fascinated and impressed with uh, the ability of viruses to respond, mm. and yet also, it's not as if they can do everything well. Mm. So the limitations on virus evolution is something that is equally intrigued me. Um, I would love to study more on, uh, for example, how virus lineages go extinct, Mm. how virus strategies might be revisited on this planet when host Mm. species go extinct. My personal feeling is that there's a certain set of strategies that probably will re-evolve in a way over time. And that's easy for me to say because it's actually very hard to prove empirically. So therefore, I can just say it. <laughs> but uh, those kinds of questions still, I feel like uh, the virology community and the evolutionary biology, they grapple with that. What does it mean to evolve as a virus? And what is the relevant time scale? I think we have pretty good insight from some virus pathogens of humans, but a real general insight is lacking. This idea of extinction is really interesting. I'm sure... It happened many times, but who would know? Right? Exactly. <laughs> That's right. No fossil record. Uh, very difficult to get the genetic signals through phylogenetics as you go into the past, although uh, you know, there are many experts who do that quite well. Uh, so I don't know what technology breakthrough might help us eventually figure that stuff out. Time machine. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I got to keep working on that. That's my uh, project going on in my garage. I'm not allowed to yeah, talk there you about go. that. Don't hold your breath on that one, maybe. But. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. But so, no, some of these ideas fit perfectly. So this morning's session here at the ASM Microbe Annual Meeting was uh, entitled Evolution in the Wild. Mm-hmm. And so sort of that combination, right, of the um, ecology, but then also, in this case, the virology, the microbial yeah. side of this. And um, just a quick Recap. So just from a kind of a concept perspective, I think really kind of fits sort of the Twivo idea of how do we take sort of the lab knowledge, some of the tools that you can apply that have, uh, you're describing in all of your background yeah. and training so, so interestingly, but then bringing that to the wild, to the real complexity around us when we go to ecological systems. And so yeah. I thought it was a really fun session. I thought call. it was too. I feel like the people who do microcosm work, for example, mm-hmm. in natural systems, they are very brave. <laughs> it is a messy world out there with lots of targets for selection. And as soon as we start building in those multiple targets and experimental uh, systems in the laboratory, you can see all these myriad ways that viruses will solve a common problem. So it just makes evolutionary prediction, it reminds us it's hard. I would not say it's impossible, Mm -hmm. but I would say it is difficult. And uh, I want to see people do more of this work that tries to recapitulate in wild microcosms or data from natural populations, confirming or not what you see in the laboratory and vice versa. I just feel like that reiterative or that iterative process is 
very important. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. not saying anything, I think, new there. We know this, and it's just difficult to do. And yeah. I would love to see more of that work being done. I agree. And so uh, the, kind of in that vein, the, one of the talks, putting microbial evolution back in the ecological theater. Yes. Yeah. Isn't that exactly. great? So this is Jennifer Lau. She's at Indiana yeah. University. Yeah. And so she captured some of that energy with plants and their mm-hmm. microbiomes. Mm-hmm. Um, and her group is also thinking how climate change might influence this. So another yeah. sort of environmental complication that comes yeah. into play. We've, we've tried to think about that, too, in our mm. arbovirus work as, you under, as mosquitoes undergo geographic range expansion under different climate conditions uh, as we move forward in time. Uh, a favorite, again, topic of mine to at least think about and try to make some headway on testing it is, if you have a mosquito moving into a geographic range region that has different uh, daytime minima and maxima, you know it's different than what has been the historical mm. evolutionary setting. So you would expect that those genotypes are going to be enriched that are quite good at, on, at the boundary of that wave front. But what does it mean for a virus pathogen that they would be transmitting? Does it mean any old variant can come in and do well and spread alongside the vector? And my expectation is no. We know enough from emergence that you have to have the right mutations to interact with, say, a mosquito vector properly or even a target host population of macroorganisms like uh, humans. So uh, what the direction to go there is it's very hard to get Mm -hmm these variants from the wild, right? You know, we've taken some clinical samples from some geographic region and say, how do these viruses perform in mosquitoes that we know evolved in that geographic region? You can kind of do the mixing and matching. And, uh, and, and you do get some convincing data that says that local adaptation matters. And I'm frankly surprised that we get those signals because in the clinic, we know we can get virus samples, but these individuals, these humans, you don't know necessarily where they got infected. So anyway, the point there is trying to do more with, say, uh, virus adaptation to different temperature regimes and then testing how those variants interact successfully or not with mosquito vectors, different populations, different species. That's where we can try and it might be a bit heavy handed, but make some headway. And ideally, we're getting insights into these true uh, vector borne systems. Yeah, so we'll find out. I don't know if you know Alex Ciotta up in sure. Albany. He I does... was on Alex's thesis committee. Wow. <laughs> he, went, he went to... Uh, so he was getting his Syracuse. degree in Albany, okay. but I happened to be his outside committee member. Yeah, so, so I, yeah. I, I went up there a couple of weeks ago and mm-hmm. talked to him about, and they, he's very interested in wild populations of mosquitoes and what viruses are in them and variants and so forth. Really. Yes. Yeah, right I up like, your alley. I like his work. <laughs> and then the others who are interested in that question, they have a lot to do to keep them busy because I don't think we know very much about this. And I'm glad Alex and others are doing the hard experiments and the, uh, the hard studies to figure it out. You know, there are so many things to investigate in science, just in microbiology and virology. Yes. And there's just not enough money. No, time and money. Mm. I agree. Uh, I I think eventually we're going to talk about phage therapy and some of the work (laughs) that... No, it's okay. I'm not rushing. Uh, The the point is that we are ambitiously trying to find phages that target these different priority pathogens identified by the WHO as the human... Humans need to be increasingly worried about the spread of antibiotic resistance and increasing mortality that's predicted to happen in human populations. So one possibility is you go back to an old idea like phage therapy. And just the point I want to make at this juncture is it's easy to find the phages uh, that are completely novel to science that kill these bacteria. We're trying to build into that Do these phages interact with virulence factors? Do they interact with resistance, uh, uh, drug resistance mechanisms to not only kill the bacteria, but exert selection on them to evolve in a way that we want them to evolve for biomedicine, to make them more uh, controllable in the future? So trying to get those bacteria to become resensitized to antibiotics, for mm. example. Uh, but the, the point I eventually will get to now <laughs> is that there's just so much biology that even if that works, right, you find the right phage and you even, as we've done, put it in a patient on an emergency basis and you get them much better, it's still uh, unclear. All the biology of the phage that drives that 
and the placement of that phage in the black box of the human body and how the target bacterial population is fortunately evolving in the right direction, but what's going on in the larger microbiome community. I mean, this stuff, as you're saying, takes time and energy. Well, as you know, Ry Young was involved yeah. in a very, very uh, well-known case of exactly. helping an individual with, a, with an infection. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we talked to him last summer yeah. And he says every day he gets a call who, oh, yeah. from someone who wants to be cured. Yeah. And he says, we're not ready. Yeah. So we have been doing a lot of this in earnest in New Haven at Yale University and Yale New Haven Hospital. We've treated 16 people so far. But I think the record for us in any one day, the folks in my group were contacted by 18 separate people wow. about this. Yeah. So this is spreading a lot through uh, the internet, social media. So people know this is happening and um, we're getting closer and closer, we and others, to maybe getting FDA approval for something that could be labeled as a drug and that is a phage or a cocktail of phages. So that's clearly what everybody is shooting for, mm. but it doesn't mean it's easy. And no, uh, Good stuff is yeah, it's, it's never easy. Exactly, right? that's right. Yeah, you, you can't rush science. And we want to be careful, we want to help people, but at the same time, we understand it can be a very slow process to get where we want to be. So you have this wonderful review article, yeah. Cell Host Microbe, on, it's kind of an overview of the history of phage therapy and what's happened recently, yeah. and we can't go over it in detail, but sure. uh, you point out that phage therapy started when phages were discovered yeah. at the beginning of the 1900s. Yeah. So... What's been going on all those years? <laughs> That's such a difficult question to unpack. Uh, so Felix Durrell, for example, one of the co-discoverers of phages, yes, in 1917, I think it was within two years that he was starting to put phages in chickens and even in humans to try and cure bacterial diseases. So uh, I think early on, had we the tools now to better understand those microbial systems and what people were dealing with, it's kind of weird how the serendipity of the accidental discovery of penicillin by yeah. Fleming, it just seemed like, oh, well, wait a minute, we can trust that much better. That is a static entity. It's something that is going to kill the bacteria, whereas in the case of phages, you can debate whether or not viruses are living, and I won't get into that, but you know it's a biological entity that can change on you. So I think it early on there was some mistrust of phages and what they might do, or at least some confusion over uh, you know, all the details of these systems. And when we stumbled into the realm of uh, capitalizing on what bacteria and fungi produce naturally as antibiotics and using them instead, the Western world ran with it. And in places where they couldn't afford to do it as much, they stayed true to phage therapy so in the USSR and then in former Soviet nations, they're still doing it, Georgia, uh, but also in Eastern Bloc nations like Poland. I mean, this is terrific work that I hope all of it eventually gets translated into English because I think a lot of it has been ignored. Mm. So I definitely believe we're standing on the shoulders of giants, people who were brave enough to try this in the past. And what we're trying to bring to the table is that if you understand the phages better that you are using, for phage therapy, I think you can do it safer in many ways easier, and it becomes more about delivery. Can you get to the site that you want and uh, a bit more predictable? As I said earlier, can you use phages that exert the right kind of selection? Because yeah. bacteria are going to evolve resistance to phages. They're quite good at doing that. So trying to find phages that cover big genotypic space and the target pathogen and having a little more confidence in what the bacteria are going to do in response. That's yeah. what, to me, it's all about. And that really came out, I thought, beautifully in your keynote talk in this Evolution in the Wild session. So you're pointing out the, using some of these evolutionary principles, the idea of a trade-off. Yeah. Um, and so in the kind of more classic or traditional work, have some of these evolutionary principles been applied before? Or is this really... In phage th therapy? Yeah. Or is this really a new thing that you're... Well, you know, it's the, kind of... I, I think the answer is yes, mm -hmm. but maybe they weren't cast quite that way in the papers that were produced. So Smith and Huggins did this great work, and we talk about it in our recent review of mouse studies and looking at phages in, in mice. And what they observed is that the bacteria that evolve to escape the phage infection are often debilitated. They're less fit. So an overarching thing that we are trying to do is use phages that leave behind 
bacterial mutants in their wake that are just easier to deal with. Either there's a cost of phage resistance or uh, the real thing we're trying to drive are these trade-offs so that, okay, the bacteria have now evolved resistance to the phages, but it makes them vulnerable to antibiotics that they had been resistant to in the past. So I, I think you see that stuff in the earlier work, but the people who were doing those studies didn't quite cast it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and here I got to give props to a lot of my, I, I come from a great scientific lineage. I got to tell you, I remember <laughs> as a graduate student, I'm, I'm about to go to the Gordon conference on microbial population biology, yeah, that's a great which I started going to my very first year wow. of grad school. So I got to interact with my, uh, academic relatives, people like Bruce Levin, who um, had trained Rich Linsky, and I, I worked with Rich, as I said earlier. But the point is, these people have kept me on my toes throughout my career. And uh, I think it's a pretty close-knit group. Um, I hope we're not too insular at times, but the point is, I think there's been a great uh, respect for the past literature and trying to emphasize to the young scientists in the microbial ecology and evolution field that, hey, look, a lot of great ideas are out there. And you may think your ideas are entirely unique, but go back and read those classic papers in microbiology and virology journals because the uh, the tidbits are there. Mm. And, and it's uh, interesting to see how kind of things revisit over time. So you, you mentioned in, the, in your review some strategies where, for example, if the phage attaches to a, a protein that's involved in virulence, mm-hmm. then Resistance uh, resistance to the phage is associated with less virulence. That's right. Or if it attaches to an efflux pump yeah. for an antimicrobial, then it becomes more sensitive. So yeah, these are the kinds know. of things we couldn't do 50 years ago. That's correct, because right? we didn't have the tools or we didn't have yeah. the understanding of these systems. And certainly we didn't have it back in the 1910s and 20s. But uh, he, he, that stuff has only come around much yeah. more recently. So the the understanding that efflux pumps and a variety of bacterial pathogens can uh, make them broadly resistant to antibiotics mm-hmm. across different drug classes. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, okay. Now that I get that, why wouldn't I try and find a phage that puts pressure on that system? And it's phages are a proximate problem for a bacterial population. If it's a lytic phage, it's lethal. So there's nothing stronger than a lethal selective agent to push a system to evolve in a more or less predictable way. So you might have a lot of genotypic solutions to it, but phenotypically, if you can get it to go in the right direction, then biomedically, that's kind of golden. And I I love the fact that we and others are seizing on that now. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you you want your efflux pump to work, uh, sorry for you, bacteria, because you're going to have to alter it and make it work less well to deal with the proximate problem of a phage interacting with those proteins and trying to kill the bacterial cell in the process. So if you, if you didn't happen to have a phage that hit an efflux pump, you could probably design one, right? Yeah. So that's what's really <laughs> cool now is that a lot of phage biotechnology is taking off. Uh, well, look, it was always there. But uh, now that people are trying to engineer phages to do the things that we want them to do, yes, you can, you can engineer phages to have a better outcome in phage therapy than mining the uh, natural systems like we do. I, I fully admit that. The real question will be what gets approved easier. Hmm. And um, I think it's, uh, it's unclear. So in many ways, what we have done has worked very well in the eyes of the FDA. We're taking a biological agent, something that is on this planet and has evolved naturally. And if we happen to capitalize on using it in therapy, Frankly, that's not that different than using an antibiotic, right? An antibiotic mm-hmm. can, it can be synthesized, right? You can have artificial antibiotics, but many of the ones that have naturally evolved and are produced by microbes are super useful to humans through time, except now that they're waning in efficacy. So will you get the same FDA approval for engineered phages? Maybe yes, maybe not. I think the playing field's pretty open right now, and the FDA... Mm-hmm realizes that we do need other solutions. So I, I, I've been very happy that we've been interacting with the FDA and people have been very open-minded mm. to what we've been doing, but we'll see where the clinical trials go. That's Because that's an interesting twist here. 
you're going to tailor phages for almost each patient, right? Yeah, you could almost make a what do we call it a personalized you could. drug. Right? That's right. So in a way, we're doing personalized medicine for each of these emergency treatments. We take the bacterial pathogens that are infecting, say, the human lung, and in the laboratory, we can screen a bunch of phages on them and see what works best, especially driving evolution in the right direction. But uh, yeah, this is, it's challenging to see what's going to come next. Yeah. So, and speaking of that, um, you know, the sources of the phage now, the non-engineered, you had a great line in your talk, which was from pond to bedside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Pond to bedside so research. I guess it gives us a little clue into where you're getting these from. Yeah. Right? Let's talk a little so, bit about sure. that. Yeah. So our first paper on this in uh, scientific reports in 2016, we happened to capitalize on some aquatic samples that were coming into our building literally at our doorstep from my colleague, David Post. He studies fish in a, a small lake called Dodge Pond in Connecticut. And we had just been looking around in soil and other sources for possible good phage candidates. And we found a great one in this pond in Connecticut. And as far as we know, even going through the literature, we're not seeing that somebody had found a phage that associates with efflux pumps naturally. And, uh, Okay, so how do we find this if you have the right screening method? And here I completely avow that it is much easier if you can capitalize on knockout collections of bacteria for a well-known system. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a collection of these bacteria, you've got individual mutants that have different genes knocked out for the efflux pump mechanism, and I'm trying to find phages that are able to infect those, those genotypes easily except for when the most outer protein is missing, right? Then I know, aha, that's very important for this phage to interact with these bacteria, bind, enter, and kill. So now I've got myself a good candidate for something that would be a lytic phage. That's a phage therapy candidate, but it's also interacting with these efflux pumps, which are generally, they're frankly notorious, right? You've got multi-drug resistant bacteria, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that are increasingly found in patients that have these efflux pumps that are just pushing everything out of the cell mm. as a drug that manages to get in. So essentially what we've shown is you can get synergy. You can get a phage interacting with an antibiotic that is ordinarily useless and it's making it into a useful drug. And that echoes something that we said earlier is you see that in the literature. People have shown synergy between phages and antibiotics, but they haven't always known why. So mechanistically, that's pretty cool if you can figure that out. It gives us, again, this greater confidence that we might be on to something because uh, you just have a little bit more assurance about what's occurring. Yeah. So that takes us, I guess, from the pond to the laboratory yep. where you're starting to screen or make predictions about what might be a good candidate. But yeah. then maybe take us to the bedside. Yeah. How did you get into right. the actual kind of therapeutic Tell situations? You, serendipity. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ben Chan, who joined my group as kind of a senior postdoc, he had been working in phage therapy industry. He'd been working in hospitals. And I just had a general ad out for a postdoc to come to my group because I would say we were long on concept and short on data for <laughs> a long time in this system. And I just needed somebody to come in who had that experience of how do you find phages in the wild that might be useful for human applications. And Ben had that in his background. So it's been a great uh, and rewarding experience working with him. But he's, he's bold. In fact, I will give a shout out to the members of my group. I don't know what it is. They're very bold about kind of taking their ideas and going, especially within the Yale University community and spreading them around and talking to people. So he somehow ends up talking to, I believe it was the head of the hospital about this idea of phage therapy and a kind of different approach. And that got us to a surgeon, Deepak Narayan, who had a patient that was kind of a medical marvel. This guy had a chronic infection on his aortic arch replacement for years. And they were, his physicians were just astonished that he was still alive. When they figured out how bad this infection was, it had eroded away part of his sternum. It was that bad. And it was a multi-drug resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection. So essentially, the long story short is the surgeon, Deepak, had confidence in this as an alternative approach. And we got the FDA emergency approval to try it. 
on the patient and it worked. <laughs> I mean, that's the long story short, but I, I, I just got to give the really brief anecdote that in the operating room, the whole idea is that they were going to take a syringe and administer the phage, an antibiotic, as close as they could to the site of the infection, and they ran into scar tissue, so they couldn't get there. So they capitalized on a pretty gruesome feature of this man's illness, and they had an oozing fistula. He had an open wound on his chest wall because the infection underlying it was so bad. Yes, right on his chest. So they took the phage and the antibiotic and administered it there, and then they soaked gauze uh, sterile gauze and the antibiotic and phage solution and laid it over it. And amazingly, in one uh, administration, this guy had his infection resolved and he went back to work in New Haven as an ophthalmologist at the tender age of perhaps 82 mm. or something like that. And he, of course, you know, this was remarkable and his family, you know, we, we talked to them and everybody was happy. And I, I was just so delighted that this man had his quality of life back. Yeah. And the, the weird irony is that he ended up dying of heart failure on the day that our paper was finally mm. released. Mm. Um, but we got to know him and it's just a tremendously brave individual who, yes, a lot of people are desperate if they run out of medical options, but it doesn't mean that the patient would agree to undergo experimental therapy. And it certainly doesn't mean that a physician would agree to yeah. do that. So uh, that was wonderful in the case of, of that first patient. Well, in a great situation too. So as you mentioned, doing that co-administration with the antibiotics, so getting at that evolutionary trade-off that you were describing. Yeah, right. So you're basically exposing the antibiotic resistant bacteria by hitting them with the phage and then kind of that second punch yes. as a, and actually showing that in this really dramatic. It's like a one, two way. punch. Yeah. Uh, and I, I got to tell you though, that it has helped us certainly with the medical community that even if they're administering a useless antibiotic, if it is the standard of therapy, they're a lot uh, more comfortable mm. with us bringing a phage in as something that's, I guess the right word is an adjuvant or something that mm -hmm. co goes in alongside and does not replace standard of therapy. So we've had a lot of success doing that. Mm. And I'll just tell you, honestly, I think it has made our path simpler because we're adding something to a trusted therapy and not kind of redoing the therapy entirely. Yeah, that's a great point. I think that's important. Yeah, I didn't realize that yeah. it would be so much easier if you just augmented it rather than replacing it. Yeah, yeah I think that the medical yeah. community can be open to new things, but yeah. there is a comfort level in what has worked historically. <clears throat> yeah. Right? Yeah. So this is published in uh, Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health. Yeah, so we ended up publishing that first case study in this relatively new journal, Evolution, Medicine, and Public Health, and it seemed like a great venue because we could tell both the evolution side of this mm -hmm. as well as give all the details of the case report. So it's called Phage Treatment of an Aortic Graft Infected with Pseudomotus Aeruginosa. Can That's you right. tell us, was this phage selected for his isolate? So, yes. In his case, we had the bacterium causing the infection. And we found out that this lead candidate that we assumed would be a great one to use in therapy, the one that came from a lake, because it's interacting with these efflux pumps and generally causing Pseudomonas aeruginosa to convert to something that's more treatable with standard chemical antibiotics. That worked in vitro for a bacterial population that was founded by this man's genotype mm -hmm. uh, that was in his body. So uh, that's generally the path that we've taken is that we get contacted by somebody who's ill and their physicians. And ideally, the very first thing we do is we get a sample of the, in, of the infecting pathogen and we can see what we can do to screen that against the library where these phages have these bags of tricks in their arsenal. And uh, they're exerting evolutionary trade-offs and if it works, uh, then it could just work in the patient. Yeah. Now that that match is not always going to happen, yeah, sure. but on average, it's been pretty good. The match between the in vitro data and at least the outcome in the patient, and we're very excited to do longitudinal studies and other ways of really figuring out better of what's occurring in the black box of the human body. But if the outcome is good, then we know we're on a good path. So in this case, you actually looked at biofilms on 
Decron. Yeah. To kind of mimic what was going on with his, uh, it was a, right. uh, a graft of some kind, a synthetic yeah, graft. That's right. right. So we took uh, bacteria, including this man's pathogen, but we've done this for a variety of, say, Pseudomonas aeruginosa genotypes, grow them on these, what I like to call, increasingly popular substrates that are placed in the human body through routine surgery. And we should applaud the fact that the medical community can do this. And however, the downside is that with the spread of multidrug resistant bacteria, these are creating awesome substrates for these bacteria to just wander into the human body and get a hold of that artificial surface and grow into a very tough biofilm that's very resilient to antibiotics getting into, inside the cells. And if it gets to be a large enough size, then it's definitely something that the immune system can't deal with either. So uh, that's the downside of, as we rocket ahead through time, about these surgeries becoming easier to do on people. If you put that up against the fact that these multidrug-resistant bacteria are also on the rise, we have to be very careful. You have to be very watchful of the, art, uh, of the typical person who's going to go through one of these surgeries, and many of them are immune compromised, so that's also pretty bad. Are, are the bacteria coming with the graft or later? Ooh, good question. Because if they're with it, you could impregnate the graft with phage. Mm. I love that idea. <laughs> that's right. So we've thought about, could you sort of take phage and use them prophylactically? And uh, that's where I, I, I guess I can mention some of the other work that we've done in a variety of virus systems is look at the evolution of particle stability. So there are some downsides to this for a virus. You can make viruses more stable. Uh, you know, we're not trying to make everything like rotavirus, which is notoriously very stable. So people shouldn't think that I'm trying to do nefarious research in my laboratory. But the point is you can pinpoint the mutations that are responsible for that. And the interesting thing is it typically slows down virus growth. You get this trade-off within viruses of uh, kind of stability versus replication speed. The point, though, is that if you understand how that works, then you might be able to build it into a phage therapy system and use that phage prophylactically on, I'm going to do surgery, I'm going to now coat this very vulnerable piece of artificial substrate in the human body with something that's going to protect it maybe for a week, or something like that. I mean, this they, to be clear, this is all science fiction at this mm, point. Yeah, sure. But uh, that is one direction that biotechnology could go. Of course, you, you know? need to know what bacteria are likely to be there, right? Right. And that's difficult to know. Genotypically, uh, I mean, you might be able to convince yourself for some particular surgeries, what are the most common infecting opportunistic pathogens, whether it's MRSA or Pseudomonas originosa or whatever. But then you've got to have the right phage to interact with that opportunistic pathogen at the genotypic level. So here's where I guess I could just spend a moment and say that an age-old liability of phage therapy has always been this assumed specificity that I've got to have uh, a phage that is so specific to the infecting target pathogen that without that match, it's going to be hopeless. And I would say that that's not quite right because we have learned that lesson, I believe, through a handful of very well-studied phage systems. And yet I'll tell you for sure, when I was in Lin Chow's lab, we were working on a rather obscure phage, Phi-6. It's a cystovirus, a double-stranded RNA uh, phage. And that phage is easily capable of undergoing a single point mutation and jumping all the way across the phylogenetic tree of Pseudomonas syringae uh, host species and happily infecting something that is never seen before with just a single mutation. So what am I saying here? I think phages can cover much broader genotypic space than people assume. And it is up to me and others to prove that is the case. But anecdotally, I've definitely seen it in my own research as far back as the mid-1990s. So now the true uh, challenge is, okay, we're going to develop all these phage therapy candidates and we want to go forward, but that's yet another challenge. Let, one, me, let one, me try and cover the space. One phage 
to kill them all. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I think Vincent's already angling for a t- title. That's the way the ring. One, <laughs> one ring got, to yeah. rule them all. That's right. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very Tolkien. I but, like that. That's right. But so, <laughs> but so, Paul, you said science fiction, but I would say increasingly science here. So yeah. you also shared not only that first case that you were involved in, but now 16 cases. Yeah. And so it sounds like things are really moving quickly and in some pretty uh, positive directions. They are. I, I really think that uh, we're almost victims of our own success in the sense that we've been helping so many patients that uh, our hair's on fire a bit with it. We're very dedicated to this. And what's been slow is more of sharing this with the scientific community and others about all the success that we've had. So we will make up for lost time and get this into the literature. I've promised myself and the people in my group. But it is going forward pretty quickly. And on average, I mean, we've seen it's been very safe, at least in our hands. And, uh, of course, one has to be careful as you move forward. You know, phages are fascinating. They can carry antibiotic resistance genes themselves. They can even carry toxin genes and bring those into a host. And if it integrates into the chromosome, you can have a creation of a pathogen through phage genes. Hmm. And I think there have been some recent papers on that, but uh, in my estimation, that's actually well known. It's more about um, prophages may be responsible for this. And the, the, the point is that I think we can go bravely into the future but understand that these are complex biological systems for which we need to know enough about them to have the confidence to move forward. Mm. But uh, that's just science. That's careful treading. Yeah. And speaking of that, so it sounded like um, you've now moved some of this research to actually used an old tried and true model, E. coli, yeah. to sort of pull back some of the um, features to then use phage or to, to kind of get a little bit more deliberate maybe in some of the ways yeah. that you're testing this. I mean, tell us a little bit about yeah. that. It's a really cool direction yeah, for that's, this. Yeah, that's been fun is, of course, I was raised on E. coli, right, in Rich Linsky's lab. And uh, Alita Burmeister, who got her PhD with Rich, so uh, she's now working with me as a postdoc, and she found in E. coli basically the same thing that we observed in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, such that these homologous efflux pumps in E. coli, you can also get the evolution of trade-offs, and you can have phages exerting selection in E. coli for it to change its toll C efflux pumps, making it more sensitive to antibiotics. So, okay, that and now that's a much easier system because you've got all these tools that it can even just, you know, really blow Pseudomonas originosa out of the water in terms of the tools you have available. So very quickly, we're making a lot of headway in that system. Uh, we have a grant in that area. So uh, that's what I love is the sort of we're doing uh, this in both the pathogens on the front lines, trying to get it into patients and help them, but we're also able to do it in these more tried and true systems and see parallel outcomes. So we're trying to have that push things forward quickly for our understanding, and yet it's just so often dizzyingly impressive what phage can do and bacteria can do when you're dealing with, in the case of phage, it's something newly discovered and... uh I always have people just assume that our work in phages and viruses, you know, I've done ARPO virus work where you're dealing with five genes and they're like, oh, come on, how much power is in that system really? And I was like, wow, an amazing amount because we can just spend a very long time trying to unpack what is going on in a system with only five genes. And in the case of this first phage, we found that helped the first patient, I think it has a genome size of about 250 KB. <laughs> so, you know, these, these candidates as phages can work remarkably well. And yet we've got a lot of biology and genetics and uh, classic stuff to, to still do, to understand them as best we can. So you've talked about some, I would say, anecdotal cases, one here, 16 there. Yeah. Is that the way the field will get past the FDA, or will a clinical trial be an no, important part? No, it's got to be clinical it? trials. Yeah. You know, and it's uh, it's very rewarding and 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 great to do the personalized medicine approach. But we're also trying to build the resources to run a clinical trial. And for us, the most obvious first target would be uh, CF patients. So cystic fibrosis patients have very 
interesting but unfortunate lung structure that makes them highly vulnerable to these kinds of opportunistic pathogens coming in and causing chronic infections, things like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and others. So they deal with this increasingly as a community of patients, and they are the ones who we've been trying to help a lot. So ideally, we can run a clinical trial that says, now let me take some patients who are not under dire circumstances. They're reasonably healthy as a CF individual, and I would like to safely test the efficacy of phages, perhaps alone, or even just one phage, being able to help them uh, have lungs that are protected from opportunistic pathogens coming in. And that's the kind of data that we need to convince the FDA that we would be on a a good path to an investigational new drug. So we uh, started a a company, Felix Biotechnology, named after Felix Durrell, who was one of the co-discoverers of phages. And we're trying to build up our resources now to run such trials. We're ambitiously thinking we've got enough to run a small trial, perhaps even by the end of this year. But I, I tell you, these these individuals, especially in the CF community, they have a very tough road. I think everybody knows that. But What an impressive community of individuals who have each other's backs. And that's what we found a lot is that they understand how dire their situation can be. And they want us to succeed, of course, but they're also uh, quite good advocates of -of out-of-the-box thinking. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, maybe that's pretty obvious, but... I you know, I don't have CF myself. I don't have any close family members who have CF, but I was just a bit naive as to how strong of a group of individuals these are and their families for looking out for new possibilities, new therapy options, and like I said earlier, having each other's backs. So yeah. they've been wonderful to work with. And you mentioned uh, one young woman in particular, Paige Rogers, a yeah. CF patient. Yeah, um, nice. And in this case, I guess get, maybe getting at the point you're making about mm-hmm. sort of, you know, not obviously not a cure for right. CF in any way, or even necessarily completely clearing these chronic bacterial infections, mm-hmm. but really kind of bending the curve on quality of life. So it was yeah. a system and maybe just share the, a little mm-hmm. bit of those details of sure. how you targeted that case and what's happening. Yeah. We thank Paige for her willingness to undergo this therapy and for her doctors in Texas to approve it. So essentially Paige was undergoing pulmonary failure and she had a pan drug resistant um, bacterial community, uh, mostly composed of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in her lungs, as indicated by her sputum samples. And she just had declining pulmonary function over time. And I believe had heard of our work, contacted us. We got a hold of a sample from her sputum of the bacteria in there. And we found that they were susceptible to these phages that were uh, able to exert evolutionary trade-offs. So uh, I was just blown away by how successful we were in adding phages to her nebulizer. I really didn't think it was going to work that well. I think of the human lung as this incredibly, I don't know, complex system and with uh, you know a lot of refugia where I would assume that the phages don't really interact with bacterial cells that frequently. And yet over the course of, I think it was nine days, several inhaled um, doses per day, Mm -hmm. she did remarkably better in an improvement in FEV1, which is a measure of how able she is to force air out of her lungs, Uh, a decrease in bacterial load, as indicated in her sputum. And the most remarkable thing is that her bacteria that we isolated from her sputum samples post-therapy recapitulated what we saw in terms of transitions of those bacteria to antibiotic resensitivity. So that was the most rewarding part of it. It It's like, wow, that not only worked well for her, but it gave her and her physicians a much better set of options that if she has an exacerbation, then they'll be able to ideally get it under control with standard chemical antibiotics. So uh, as you said, Nels, it's, it's very difficult to eradicate sometimes entirely the infecting bacteria from patients with CF, non-CF bronchiectasis, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. But if you can get them and their infections under control, then uh, they'll be better off. And maybe I'll just quickly add that 
I, I, I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm, I'm shocked at some of the, the ways that we unfortunately have to deal with some uh, maladies. So let me just quickly say that the course of action sometimes is if a lung is so badly infected that they basically want to take the lung out. And that itself, you know, as dire as the listeners rightfully think that that is, they won't even do it as physicians and surgeons if they feel like there's a threat for that bacterial infection to then spread into the remaining lung. So some of what we've been doing is just getting these patients under control so that the bacterial infection has been greatly reduced, giving the physicians and surgeons the confidence to remove a lung as the thing that is the, the goal, as, you know, as gruesome as that might sound, you know, as debilitating as that might sound, if that's the only option and they can't even get there yeah. because of the high density of the bacteria in that infected lung and an abscess, then that's something else we've been contributing to. Well, it's fascinating too, Paul, because, you know, as you mentioned earlier, when you were applying for jobs and there was no, <laughs> there's no one home at the medical school. No, that's <laughs> here, okay. <laughs> it's okay. But we're here now, right? Yeah. Uh, some years later, unexpected path, yeah. taking the evolutionary views, the really yeah. basic science approaches. Yeah. And I can imagine medical schools lining up at your door <laughs> for years to come oh, based on this progress that is just inspiring and really remarkable. Oh, thank you, Nels. Yeah, it's been, it's been a nice path in the last couple of years to go down. You don't need to go to medical school. <laughs> That's good to know. You're saving lives, yeah. clearly. Yeah, I, I just and, have to say, my, my father, who uh, <laughs> I, I wrote him towards the end of my college education, a letter explaining to him why I decided not to go to medical school, mm. and I was going to graduate yeah. school instead. And I'll tell you the truth, I don't remember writing the letter. <laughs> and he kept it. Mm. And he said, oh, God, I was proud for you for making a decision that you felt you wanted to share with your parents about what you were going to do with your life. And... Uh, I just, uh, maybe my point is, as a young scientist, you have all these paths that you can go down, and it just kind of seems like you go down one path, but you can revisit things mm -hmm. that you wanted to do earlier. And I have spent my whole career, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I definitely tell myself, I, I, I tell people I'm a shiny object scientist. I work on these, these different virus systems. It's not like I worked on them as postdocs mm -hmm. and abandoned them. Instead, I have this microbe zoo. And this virus zoo in my laboratory because I uh, refuse to let any of them go. They all fascinate me the more I learn about them. So you go for the shiny objects? Is I do go for the shiny objects. I do. And I guess my, my major problem is everything looks shiny. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been a lot of fun. We recently used that on TWIV to, to explain immunodominance. The immune system goes for the shiny parts. Yes. <laughs> right? I think it's true. Yes, it does. You know, Paul, we could go on forever. In fact, we should bring you on to TWIV sometime and we oh, could love to. talk for an hour and a half about the details of these phages and so forth. But do uh, you want to want to wrap it up with a couple of picks, Nels? Yeah, that sounds good. So we're, we'll move to our science pick of the week. And uh, if you're inspired, Paul, at all, have anything that comes to mind, feel sure. free to jump in at one point. But so I wanted to highlight and lift up um, a science outreach kind of communication outfit. This is called Science Glass. It's from Nick Shakuma, he's a assistant professor at San Diego State University. He's teamed up with some of his colleagues, and they are doing really cool um, science outreach on YouTube, short video clips where it's basically uh, recorded of the video in front of a piece of glass with a grad student, postdoc, faculty member using markers and explaining in real time. And there's something that really is kind of captivating about that, seeing a scientist explain and draw, but all kind of not with their back towards you, facing you through this science glass, as they're calling it. So anyway, check this out. We'll put up the link. And um, by the way, Nick Shakuma, keep an eye on this guy's research program. Really interesting. Multi, speaking about evolution in the wild. So bacteria that have proteins that look like phage tails that convince marine worms to undergo metamorphosis. I mean, it gets just absolutely wild. That's cool. Yeah. So keep an eye on Nick and science class. That's my That's cool. pick I of the like week. That. Very cool. How about you, Vincent? What do, what do you have for so us? So I have a paper that is part of a, a podcast that I'm doing later today. Um, so Mark Martin is from... University of Puget Sound he teaches microbiology to undergraduates. And I said, let's do a twim. And you talk about 
great papers for teaching undergraduates. And one that he picked is uh, Graham Hatful's recent phage therapy yeah. paper, yep. right? Because he said students love phage therapy. Mm -hmm. So this is called Engineered Bacteriophages for Treatment of a Patient with Disseminated Drug-Resistant Mycobacterium Abscessus. I think this was a CF patient yeah. who had yeah. lesions all over, and they gave phages that his high school students in the C phages program yeah. isolated. They made sure it killed the isolate. Plus, mm -hmm. they modified some of them to delete the repressor so they would be lytic. Exactly. And the kid got better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've loved, uh, I've been talking to Graham about that work, and we're trying to partner with him to do some work uh, further helping patients. But but I agree. This kind of I mean, stuff like, is so inspiring. Yeah. Right? Well, it was I mean, fun to see Graham was here, wasn't he? At yeah. the session. And yeah. Here. Graham was in attendance, and yeah. he was able to see my talk. I was grateful. What a great that. link, right, from the education, yeah. science education. We sometimes, I think, underestimate that. And we do these sort of lab experiences where it's sort of meant to s kind of simulate what we do, but it doesn't really right. connect all the way through. It's not quite real. But yes. this breaks that down I completely agree. from classroom Graham, to bedside. Graham is, is inspiring. A whole, a whole generation of virologists. 15-year-old yeah. patient, chronic CF, disseminated mycobacterium abscessus, three-phage cocktail, Following bilateral lung transplantation. Oh, uh, right. I'd forgotten about that. Wow. Yeah. And it was tolerated and he improved. Yeah. His wound, his sternal wound, he had a fistula also mm -hmm. closed and these things went, oh my gosh. Yeah. This is very inspiring, but you know, they're one off. So uh, that's it. That's I the agree. They're very do. inspiring and uh, we can make some comparisons across them, but it'll be great to see this in a whole cohort. Is this, is the field growing? Oh yes, <laughs> good, <laughs> remarkably, and I think it's it's wonderful. It's I'll tell you, you know, when I was working on phages with Lin Chow, I just feel like I would go to virology meetings, and maybe there were some virologists who would cut their teeth on phages. Yeah, not much, right? Yeah, but not much. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. now it's very different. There, it's it's uh, people see it as increasingly useful to study. You know, you phage get system. young people really excited when. Something they do can save a life. Yes. And uh, Graham's course, I think, C-Phages has been awesome and HHMI support for it. And you see it at universities that they're either teaching that or a version mm -hmm. of it. So we teach a version of it at Yale. Cool. Yeah. And the kids name the phages after themselves yeah. in the paper. Did <laughs> yeah, you notice right. that? I of course. It, yeah. It's empowerment. <laughs> it's just, and I, that's going to attract a lot of people because, as you know, phages are great systems to work in. Yes. Relatively easy to do things. You don't need any bovine serum albumin that's right, right? and all that exactly. stuff right <laughs> much easier to do well and then you know maybe currently it's one case at a time and a lot of kind of anecdotal stories but i do really want to lift up that bigger concept here that paul pointed out in his early in his talk which is using the concept of the evolutionary trade-off and so i think there's a lot of lip Great. service Great. to this notion of oh yeah we'll do something that's evolution proof mm -hmm. or somehow get around this but very very little delivering on that we just kind of fall back into the same in an arms race, in a yeah. sense, that yeah, yeah. evolution has played out. But this is a case where maybe finally we're kind of thinking around the corner a little bit sure. and actually yeah, sure. kind of delivering Thank on some you. of those I ideas. So. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 Thanks All right. for having me, guys. Yeah, yeah. pleasure. You, it's Paul. Twevo 44. You can find it at Apple Podcasts. If you listen on a phone or a tablet, you're using a podcast player, please subscribe. We'd love to have you subscribe. It's free and you get every episode, and we know how many people are listening. That makes it different to us. If you want to see our show notes where we put links to the papers and our picks, that's microbe.tv slash Twevo. And if you really like what Nels and I do here and what we do on all the other podcasts, consider uh, financial support. We do all this gratis. We give it away because we think knowledge should be free. And uh, you could give us a buck a month, say, less than a cup of coffee, and you get five high-quality Science podcasts, which is scientific truth. There's no fake news here. So it's all real stuff. <laughs> Join us on the adventure. <laughs> and if you want to ask us questions, Tuivo at microbe.tv, our guest today from Yale University, Paul Turner. It's been an honor talking oh, with you. Wonderful. You. It's been great to be on. Thanks, Get you yeah. back on Twiv, okay? All right. <laughs> Maybe the, when I visit uh, Yale, sure. I can come and do a separate Twiv with you, yeah, but we'll it. do something. That's great. great. Yeah. Nails Eldies at cellvolution.org. L Early Bird on Twitter.
Thanks, Nels. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. Great to be in vivo. I feel like a kid in the candy store here at the Wonderful. ASM Microbe. There's so much exciting stuff happening. And to be in the company of your science heroes is another uh, really fun thing to yeah, do. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah it's cool. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws, music on Twevo, tramplededbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. <laughs>